Overly, I'm a technology reporter for Politico. I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before we jump into it, um, very quick announcement, schedule change announcement. So after this, there was supposed to be a coffee break, but due to some scheduling on the Hill, they're going to jump right into the keynotes, and then the coffee break will be at the end of the three keynotes, just so you, just so you can prep yourself. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, this session is all about the, the future. We're talking about the year 2030 and what tech looks like you know, at that time. Um, so we'll be peering into a crystal ball, I think. Um, my, my aim as the moderator, though, is to try to tether us to reality and talk not just about maybe what we think should be the case in 2030, but what will actually be the case in 2030 and how do we get there. And so to help me do that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Katie McInnes, the Policy Counsel at Consumer Reports, Charlotte Slayman, the Senior Policy Counsel for Public Knowledge, we have Steve Del Bianco, the president and CEO of the trade association NetChoice. And finally, Ben Sperry, the associate director of legal research for the International Center for Law and Economics. So thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start the conversation on antitrust, which obviously is an issue getting a lot of attention nowadays. Um, on the campaign trail, we've heard Democratic frontrunners like Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator Bernie Sanders talk about this idea about breaking up big tech companies. So again, looking ahead to the year 2030, do Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple still exist as sort of singular standalone companies the way they do today? Maybe if we want to go down the line, who, who wants to jump in on that first? Um, so I actually don't cover antitrust as much as uh, you do, so I'll just <laughs> let's okay. Do yes, thank you. Um, so the question is, do they exist as individual entities? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't think that the goal is to uh, make these companies no longer working in the space. Um, the goal is that there will be a lot more companies working in the space and that there will be actual competition. Um, so I think antitrust is going to be a big part of the work that we do to get there by 2030. Um, I think the other really important component is going to be regulation. Um, there are currently antitrust investigations going on at the federal level, at the state level, um, into digital platforms, and we are seeing increasing evidence that there is market power, that Google has market power in a variety of advertising-related markets, that Facebook has market power in social media. That's a really important threshold question for these antitrust investigations as they're moving forward. Um, even if those antitrust cases are very successful, regulation is going to be a big piece of the puzzle. So that's something that we're working on hard here in Washington at Public Knowledge and with a lot of coalition partners um, thinking about what that regulation should look like and how we can get there. Some of the really important tools that we think about to help promote competition from a regulatory perspective are interoperability, non-discrimination, and concurrent merger review that is not limited by the current Hart Scott Rodino cap so that even small mergers will be analyzed. So I, I hope we'll get a chance to talk more about that today. Yeah, th thanks for the question too. When, when we watched um, candidate Warren and all the rest of those Democratic uh, candidates on the debate stage, uh, they all said, they all backed up Elizabeth Warren on this notion that we've got to break up Facebook and Google. They all raised their hands to say that and they, took turns saying they were worried about election interference, disinformation, privacy, censoring of controversial conservative speech, because they didn't think platforms did enough of that. And none of those concerns that they raised have a single thing to do with antitrust. They have nothing to do with breaking up a company at all. They simply wanted to show their constituents and their base that they will stand up to these big American companies. And there's another incentive. When, you, when you're a candidate who wants to be sure that speech that's negative about you gets moderated, you want to work the refs a little bit. You want to make sure that Facebook, Google, and Twitter will be very careful when they have to moderate something that's said about you. So I, I can't believe there's any serious belief that by 2030 that those companies will fall to an antitrust case causing Facebook, Google, Amazon to break up. The consumer welfare standard is in place today, and unless that was completely turned on its head, it is not nearly enough to show market power. You have to show what consumer harm that exceeds the efficiencies and benefits. And we haven't even begun those conversations yet with respect to Facebook, Google, and Amazon. And what do you think? 
Well, whether uh, Facebook and Google exist in 2020 or not, um, I submit not only can I not know, uh, do I not know, I should say, but we can't know. Uh, if this panel was held in before 2010, uh, or sometime, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the question might have been, is MySpace going to be the dominant social network that's still around? Using much of the same reasoning, right? Lock-in effects, uh, net, uh, network effects, um, natural monopoly arguments. Well, Yahoo, um, who has won the search wars, as one headline proclaimed, still be the dominant search engine. Well, we need to penalize companies like AOL uh, that has the instant messaging service uh, AIM, uh, right? Because it just acquired ICQ. I don't know if anybody remembers ICQ. Sure. Um, or will the Microsoft um, Internet Explorer still be the dominant browser? These would have been the questions had we done this panel at a different time in history, a different snapshot. So I, I would submit to you that not only do we not know whether Google and Facebook will still be around, but if they are, they might not be the power they are today. And that's completely irrespective of what we do with the antitrust question. Uh, these things tend to be figured out in the marketplace, um, often quicker and more efficiently and more in line with consumers' desires than they are by law. And Charlotte, what do you, how would you respond to that? I mean, do, do you think the market competition over the next 10 years is sort of it will keep these companies in check is sort of the suggestion. Um, I don't think it will if we don't have government action. Um, one of your examples, Internet Explorer as a dominant browser, I think a big reason that Internet Explorer is not a dominant browser is because of antitrust action against Microsoft that was targeted at the browser. Um, and I think you gave some great examples that were happening from a time when we did see a lot of competition. But today, I'm afraid that we are not seeing a lot of competition. And so we need to act to change that. Well, I want to ask, you know, the, the prospect of regulation was raised. And, you know, I think we talk about breaking up these big tech companies, which is hard to do for a number of reasons, including the fact that it's, it would be very expensive and involve a very long legal battle. But one, it has sort of triggered, in a way, conversations about whether or not existing antitrust laws are sufficient to sort of keep a check on these digital, the digital economy, essentially, right? The fact that some of these laws were written over a century ago, and you know the the economy, the way it functions today, looks very different. Um, so I want to sort of work in reverse, and Ben, I'll come to you first on that question. You know, as we look to the year 2030 and and the decade in between, you know, do you foresee changes to antitrust law or a modernization, as it's been called, of antitrust law? Well, it's interesting how uh, if you take a longer historical view, we're calling a modernization of antitrust law when. Um, it's actually going back in time to a pre-modernization uh, in antitrust law, as some saw it at the time, um, when the Chicago School came through and we had this consumer welfare standard start to take hold um, as the, the kind of the way, the, what anchors um, competition analysis. Um, I don't know where it's going. I mean, there's obviously those that argue that it should go that way. Um, uh, I do think, though, that that would be a mistake. Um, that if we move away from uh, consumer welfare, it's going to be replaced by something else. And whether that means we're now replaced by a standard that says, if you hurt competition in the form of hurting competitors, you'll see a very different economy, and it won't always necessarily be the benefit of consumers. Um, small isn't always necessarily more efficient. Um, and I think that's true not only in the economy-wide area, but especially true um, when we're talking about some of the things that we see in technology policy. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, lo looking ahead, this notion that the law would be changed has to be grounded in the motivations for why. I mean, you have expressed perhaps some concern that there's consumer harm. I can't wait to hear what that might be. But today, the saber rattling over antitrust coming out of, well, the White House and Justice Department is because if all you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. If all the government has is antitrust and the president's angry at Jeff Bezos and the Washington Post, well, they'll rattle the antitrust saber against Amazon because it's Jeff Bezos' company. There really has nothing to do with the size of the company and antitrust law. By the same token, many conservatives, and I am one, uh, don't like to be moderated on social media platforms. So they'll rattle the saber of antitrust to break up platforms or modify Section 230. 
And all of these are, as I said earlier, Stephen, work in the ref, raising the awareness in these companies that they have to be a little gentle and careful with constituents who hold power, who can bring antitrust cases, or who can mess with the law that enables the internet to actually exist. Well, as a quick follow-up, and Charlotte, I do want to get your perspective there, but obviously you, you represent these companies. But do they hear this saber rattling? Do you see a change from them in response to, in response to that or, or not? Yeah, I mean, you're a very keen reporter who watches things closely, so Stephen knows the answer is yes. They listen intently and come up with any way they can to try to uh, absorb while deflecting the criticism and make changes to community standards, modify the way in which people can appeal moderation standards. Uh, the companies do listen and hear it, and they are well aware that Washington, D.C. can really get in the way. But big companies, Stephen, as you know, can probably absorb a lot of new regulation. They can even afford a lot of the litigation. It's the smaller entrants that you were hoping for in the next 10 years that don't have a chance if we were to institute brand new regimes, throw out the consumer welfare standard, and pretend that market share is not really your company's share, but I can add together the two biggest companies, Facebook and Google, call it 70% and claim that that's market power, because that's precisely the theory the state AGs are using. Charlie? So I do think that we need to modernize the antitrust laws. Uh, I don't think that we need to uh, throw out the consumer welfare standard. Um, the way that antitrust law was envisioned, the statute is very broad and it's supposed to be judges incorporating new economic learning. Um, there has been a lot of new economic learning since the Chicago School that has not been incorporated. These are economics professors, the type of people who speak at the antitrust bar spring meeting. Um, they have a lot of ideas that ought to be incorporated into antitrust law today and it's not happening through the judges. Um, so I do think we need legislation to update the antitrust laws and incorporate that new economic learning. And I think that's going to make our antitrust laws more effective. But also we are dealing with um, not a completely new problem, but a problem that is not going to be solved by antitrust alone. So we have been looking back at some of the uh, communications industries of the past and the regulation that we've done there. And we can learn from that which of those regulations were very effective at um, helping new entrants to get success and which of those regulations were not. Um, so it's a pro-competition regulatory plan that will make it possible for small businesses to really thrive. Um, and it is not targeted at additional regulatory compliance for small businesses, but rather additional obligations that the dominant firms will have for small businesses to create a fair playing field and allow competition. You know, I, I, made, uh, I made my living by building a small company and selling it to a big company. And I will predict, Stephen, that by 2030, Facebook, Google, and Amazon won't have, end, won't have done any significant new acquisitions because the effect of this tech lash and antitrust fervor will be for regulators to get in the way of significant new acquisitions. And that will get in the way of a lot of small companies whose main path to growth is to burn a lot of venture capital money until they run out of that. And if they're lucky to go public, fine. But most don't go public. They sell to the larger companies, which, well, would be the target of antitrust to prevent them from making acquisitions. I don't know how that's going to work for small business. So I don't want to take over the whole panel with this topic, but I'm very excited about it. Um, the large companies are still doing acquisitions, so I don't see that concern happening. The, the tech lash is already uh, happening, and the acquisitions are still going on. Um, but I would also prefer a world in which being bought by one of the largest companies is not the only exit strategy. It would be great for companies to have multiple options. Um, and the sort of kill zone, I think, is a real problem. Um, companies should certainly still be able to merge in some circumstances. That's not at all what I'm suggesting. But uh, I think it is a problem today that the main exit strategy is to be bought by one of four companies. Well, I want to follow up on a point that was made, and, and hopefully, Katie, we can bring you in on this one. I, I want to make sure you're included because it will relate to privacy. And that's there's been discussion around the consumer welfare standards and sort of the metrics by which we look at company size and influence in the market. And you've interestingly seen this in a bipartisan fashion, um, which, you know, I think as we look to 2030, sort of measuring the political will of any of these issues is going to be a key factor. But there has been some bipartisan questions around whether, for instance, we should look at the impact that large tech platforms have on privacy. 
or we should look at the impact that <clears throat> large tech platforms do have on speech as opposed to just looking at price, especially given that a lot of these services are free to consumers, or at least free in the sense that you're not paying money, perhaps you're paying in your data. And so, Katie, I'd like to come to you as someone who obviously thinks a lot about privacy. How, how should the, the privacy conversation maybe intersect with some of these conversations about the size of these platforms? That's a great question. I think this is one that's not really um, well integrated into the antitrust conversation in general. If you have data about hundreds of thousands of consumers, what does it matter whether or not you acquire another uh, advertising uh, metric or uh, venue? It doesn't really affect your decisions or how consumers can choose to interact with the marketplace. Uh, but I think we'll learn a lot from the CCPA a couple of years from now, right? Like, do we see smaller businesses choosing not to collect some information on consumers that they don't need because then that would uh, open themselves up to further regulatory issues? And I think that's the kind of conversation that should have been happening from the beginning with a lot of companies not seeing data as a site proverbial oil, but rather data is an asset and also a harm for the business itself. So I think we'll see how uh, companies re respond to the CCPA to see whether or not uh, the company is going to mature in their uh, data practices generally. And Ben, what do you think of this idea of sort of looking at a broader, perhaps, definition of, of market influence? Well, well, I'm in principle. I mean, antitrust can already do that under the consumer welfare standard. It would just be a non-price effect. Uh, privacy would be considered a non-price effect. Um, I mean, businesses clearly compete on more than one margin. It's not only price, it's quality. Um, of privacy could be considered one. Uh, but these are things that are, from a consumer perspective, um, you trade on different margins. And, and it seems, at least empirically, that whatever consumers might say they want in terms of privacy, they tend to trade it for very cheaply. Um, that maybe that they are making decisions uh, that suggest that that's not the highest quality that they're considering, uh, all the things being equal. Uh, but nonetheless, these things are somewhat in tension. So if you have uh, antitrust action that would either break up a company or otherwise try to go after them for antitrust liability because of uh, they, they don't like their privacy policies, you may end up in a world that has uh, effectively more expensive goods and services online. Uh, there is a trade-off that could be there, and that's true with regulation as well. In an internet ecosphere that relies upon data-powered advertising um, to uh, allow access to a lot of content to be free, or at least non-priced, um, you change that by making privacy uh, or data very expensive to, to collect and then use for advertising you will see it have to be paid for either in another way or less free, well, less content could be available altogether. Like, at the very least, we'll know less free content will be available. And Stephen, you asked for predictions. So here's a prediction and a prayer that by 2030, the privacy advocates in America will get what the American consumers have known for about 75 years, is that when you get free content, free media, free television, subsidized newspaper, advertising, that it's paid for by what newsflash is paid for by the advertisers who want to put ads in front of people that they believe would be interested in what they have to sell. If they don't have any personal information at all, the advertisers base it on the, well, the audience demographics. During a football game, we're all going to see lots of ads for pickup trucks, car insurance, Viagra, beer, and pizza. And you get a little tired of that. It's possible that advertising could be somewhat more sophisticated and go right up to, but perhaps not cross over the creepiness factor, where people think that ads are following them around. And I believe the consumers understand when ads are paying for something to make it free to me, it's my eyeballs that are being sold to the advertisers. Uh, newsflash, that is not an alarming concern to consumers. They would always love maybe more privacy than less, but I don't believe that consumers are freaked out about the idea that advertising that's targeted is more effective and will therefore provide even more financial support for hiring reporters and producers and buying original content. Well, I want to get Katie to respond to that because I will say it does seem, in, especially in the last few years, we've seen more of an awakening or at least a greater awareness for some of these privacy trade-offs. You know, I certainly 
media and lawmakers in Washington have been asking that question. You've seen consumer groups asking those questions. You know, where do you see that conversation evolving over the next 10 years in, in terms of consumer sentiment around privacy? And, and as Steve said, sort of some of these trade-offs for content or advertising that's tailored to them versus maybe preserving information they don't want to be known. Well, first of all, I think we're going to have a bubble burst on this whole behavioral advertising gambit, right? We've been told for years that we're trading our, our, our time and our personal intimate data that we're not even having any control over sharing, by the way. So you don't have an exchange in this kind of marketplace. This is happening whether or not you're partaking in it just as a user of the web. So there is not really this exchange that I think many people think is there. Yes, these services are free, but they're using my time and my intimate details to um, target advertisements to me and others like me that we may or may not want or even be interested in seeing in, despite the fact that there's other models of funding these websites. Uh, Alexander Aquisti recently did a study showing that the return on behavioral slash targeted advertising is incredibly low and that probably advertising companies are overstating the benefit of this service that they're uh, providing for a bunch of different companies. So I think that that's one thing that's going to happen. Secondly, I really do hope by 2030 we no longer have a conversation about this privacy paradox because we've actually passed a US federal law that gives consumers the ability to control who has their information and the ability to actually make a decision about who's going to have access to that, which they don't have now and haven't had for 30 years that we've been having this conversation. Hopefully by 40 years in, we'll figure something out. Uh, my fingers are bigly crossed on that one. I'm very excited. Uh, and I hope you all will join me in fighting for a federal privacy law that gives you your rights um, on the marketplace. But I also think that one final discussion that's going to happen is that people are going to get tired of seeing these behavioral ads, whether or not there's a good return on uh, investment there. I think that people aren't going to be interested in being marketed to based on the kind of teeny tiny little box that have been put in by advertisers. If you look at the list that they have uh, for, for individuals from different data broker sites, these tags are extremely insulting, and I think if people had more input into it, which we hopefully will have through the California and Vermont data, privacy, data broker uh, lists that are now being put into effect, uh, I hope that people will be able to push back and maybe advocate for their own rights in the marketplace. Well, I want to I want to go down the line on sort of a, a question that you raised, which is a federal privacy law. That's something industry has called for. That's something advocates have called for. Um, we've seen some drafts sort of floated around and proposed. Um, in the year 2030, do we have a federal privacy law, and does it take us the full decade to get there? We'll go to Charlotte and then down the line. Um, I think we will have a federal privacy law. I really hope it doesn't take us a full decade to get there. Um, I think it's also really important as the, you know, bringing the antitrust perspective, I do want to say that I think antitrust is not going to be sufficient to protect people's privacy. We absolutely do need a federal privacy law to protect people's privacy. One of the big reasons, like Katie was describing, is that people don't have a good understanding of how they can control their data and what their data is going to be used to do. Um, so I think simply having a marketplace without uh, consumer protections is really not going to be sufficient for that reason. Katie, I'll take your invitation to work with you on a federal privacy law. Charlotte, I'll agree with you. It won't take 10 years, but I guess that's where our agreement ends. <laughs> because the last thing we want to do is copy aspects of GDPR that made their way into California's law. We need a single national standard and not the patchwork, but the California law, um, by the state's own reckoning, ends up costing 50, what is it, $55 million uh, across all of the half a billion companies that will have to comply with it. Those costs are bearable by the large companies that are members of NetChoice, but they are not bearable by small companies. And one of the aspects of that privacy law we'll end up having to debate is this notion of opt-in versus opt-out. Because large companies can get consumers to opt-in for sharing, because you know who the big company is, and they've built up a record that perhaps gives you the notion to trust them. But if Stephen and I start a brand new company, we will have no foreknowledge. Consumers are not likely to opt into a brand new and unknown company. And we're going to make it that much harder to start businesses that acquire a lot of users funded by advertising. And then this notion of right to delete or right to be forgotten is one that Americans are going to have to really get their arms around. The idea that it, it can be gamed so badly to where near a million Europeans are appealing to Google to remove from search engine things about themselves that they find embarrassing and inconvenient, but that might be very valuable to those who believe they have a right to know if you're 
medical license has been revoked or you've been convicted of a crime or, or some other important information before I loan you money or go into a business with you? Um, it does seem likely that there will be a privacy law that's in place. Um, and I think that stars are likely aligning for that to happen sooner than later. Um, in part, from what has been noted, uh, industry doesn't really want to have to deal with 50 jurisdictions, 50 different state laws on privacy. Um, they, I think what's really might happen, if, if, if it's going to happen soon, is you'll see a federal privacy law that also preempts state laws like the CCPA. Um, at least I'm sure that would be the attempt um, by uh, industry um, in the near term. Uh, whether that's a good thing or not could be debated, uh, but I think overall we need to consider the costs and benefits um, at all times of federal privacy legislation and the trade-off that I mentioned before um, and what that might mean for the internet ecosystem, uh, including from a consumer perspective, whether you would rather uh, have things paid for as they are now, which is implicitly, essentially, uh, with your data, or by spending more money uh, that you can actually see leaving your bank account. Well, I want to ask a related question because, you know, and I, this is where I really want a, a reality check because, as we know, Washington has a habit of moving rather slowly on these things. You know, I can think of cyber breach notification being a key example where we have state laws everywhere but, but have yet to agree on a federal standard. Over the next decade, do, do you all continue, do you see this trend of sort of state level policy, right? State sort of driving a lot of these key conversations, be it around privacy or even antitrust. Does that trend continue for the next 10 years? Do we see Congress maybe being more proactive or aggressive on some of these issues. Steve, I'd like to come to you first. Thanks, Stephen. Um, this is what I've been doing for 25 years. The states do tend to lead on these things. Uh, think about it. In 50 states with 1,000 to 2,000 pieces of legislation a year, we deal with 100,000 bills, and a, bill can, a bad idea can become a law in two weeks in most states. And that means that all of industry, uh, members of NetChoice, spend vast sums of money and a lot of time on airplanes in the state capitals to try to stop these bad ideas from becoming laws. When we can't stop them, we at least try to make them roughly consistent. And Stephen, all of the data breach laws are very nearly identical. And that's because we worked hard to make them consistent. In that regard, it reduced the drive to run to Washington for a preemption law. Earlier than that, we had done the Can Spam Act with Steve Miller, who's sitting over there, because the states got different. They diverged on their law. When it comes to privacy, the divergence of the California law from common sense, let alone other states, means that we will run to Washington and seek that. So the answer is yes. By 2030, we will still see the states trying to lead the way because it's so easy to pass a law in a state. And I don't think that state lawmakers really care if something they enacted becomes overturned for constitutional purposes. That doesn't bother them. They got the sound bite. They got to stand up for their constituents and stand up to big companies. So they're going to do more of it in the future. Um, so in antitrust in particular, I do think it's very important that the states have been involved, and I think that will continue. Um, the federal agencies are now also investigating these companies, which is great, but for many years they uh, were not bringing any cases. Uh, and so that was an opportunity for the states to step in, and I think we may uh, continue to see um, states sort of taking a stronger stance than we see at the federal government, which I think is a really healthy um, thing for antitrust law. Yeah, and we, we mentioned uh, Washington's in action at this point. The reason why we have so many data breach notification bills at the state level is because your federal government did not act even after the Equifax data breach. So I don't think that it's necessarily helpful to say that the state lawmakers don't care about the bills that they're writing and putting into law. I think they're hearing from constituents and they're trying to meet those needs as quickly and as well as they can. And a lot of these state lawmakers are doing so without staff that we have here uh, in Congress. So this is really, a, a, it's great to see these actions at the state level. They're also reacting to their consumer complaints. We have the uh, biometric privacy law in Illinois since 2008. If we had pushed for that at the federal level, you know that we'd still be right where we are now. So it's great that these states are acting and looking to help their constituents where they can. And it's also a great moment for us to say, 
why can these states do it when the federal government cannot? Maybe we should be pushing in Washington harder on these issues. And I, I agree with, uh, with uh, Steve's point that we don't necessarily want every single part of the GDPR, but I do think that some parts of it that has made it into the state law, uh, for, so like a, one way of having the right to be forgotten is the right to ask a company to delete your data, which we now have under the CCPA in California. That's a wonderfully American understanding of a right to be forgotten rule that still is in compliance with the uh, First Amendment here in the U.S. And so I think that the, we're seeing amazing innovation at the state level exactly as our founders intended, and I hope the federal government acts but doesn't act to quell all these state actions. Yeah, speaking of amazing innovation, the Illinois biometrics law that you're so much in favor of has resulted in a huge bonus to the plaintiff's bar. Plaintiff's attorneys in Illinois brought lawsuits immediately against Apple, Shutterfly, Amazon, Facebook. In other words, companies that allowed you to identify your own family members in your photos. Because the Illinois biometrics law said that it doesn't matter if it's my own family, you get a statutory amount of damage for every biometric application that wasn't done without express written consent. So today, photo facial recognition of your own photos isn't allowed in Illinois. Nest cameras, ring doorbell cameras, they don't offer any of the facial recognition facilities in Illinois that would allow you to identify the babysitter, the daycare provider, or family members or delivery men. So the biometric law in Illinois is a great example of why we don't want to allow the state's experiments to get copied by other states because it has not served consumers, but rather has gone after big pocketed, uh, large deep pocketed large companies to the benefit of the plaintiff's bar. How many of you have photos that are public on LinkedIn, Facebook, or some other social media platform that contains your face? How many of you think that you're probably in that sweep done by Clearview AI? How many of you live in Illinois? <laughs> so you have no recourse. Thank goodness. Uh, I just wanted to know real quick on just the point of data security and not having a federal law. That, I mean, there's no comprehensive data breach law at the federal level, but the Federal Trade Commission has been acting uh, in enfor through enforcement actions through the FTC Section 5, uh, FTC Section FTC Act Section 5, um, to do data security enforcement actions for quite some time. Um, dealing with breach and inadequate data security measures taken by companies to protect consumer data. So it's not that there's nothing at the federal level. Um, I think the debate could be whether there should be something more comprehensive, but both in the privacy and data security realms, the FTC has been essentially regulating um, through these enforcement actions for some time. I want to ask a question on facial recognition um, and artificial intelligence, because that is an area where we're starting to see more talk of regulation. It's sort of an emerging um, topic within the tech policy realm. Um, you know, as you sort of think about you know, how that reg regulation of that space could play out over the next 10 years, what are some of the big factors that you think will come into play or that you think will kind of dictate how that conversation unfolds? Um, yeah, so I'm not an expert on facial recognition technology, but I think that the use of it in public spaces is probably going to be the most galvanizing uh, moment for all of us. And at the moments when retail locations are now deploying it will also be, I think, a hugely galvanizing moment. Uh, you may not be putting your photos on Facebook or may not allow their facial recognition tool. You may not have a ring camera on your home, but facial recognition technology will be deployed in public spaces and in brick and mortar retail locations. And I am expecting that you won't really have a good way of opting out of that experience. I think um, the experience that we saw with Hong Kong and the protesters recently is a great example of how pervasive this technology is and how you really have to just cover your face or work on taking down the polls as a way of opting out. Obviously, our country is not China, and I think that we'll progress in a different way, but I do think that once it enters uh, public spaces, it's going to be a completely different conversation. Some of the trade-off between privacy and security is subjective, and, and America tends to vacillate on how we feel about those two. Um, another 9-11 might change completely the calculus between privacy and security if facial recognition in a public space would have, would have captured some terror suspects on the way into a stadium. So a lot of our public officials are worried about getting, well, getting called out for not having done enough. So I, we are seeing more and more law enforcement authorities acquiring facial recognition capabilities and technology 
And at the federal level, there's a clash over what they might restrict local governments from even doing. In the private space, it's a, it's a different conversation, but I believe the, the focus will mostly be about privacy versus security in public spaces with the ability to identify who are known bad actors. Yeah, and I think one thing to consider in that is security for whom? I think we saw after 9-11 that security for some groups was guaranteed and security for others was put into some, some question. Uh, we saw a greater policing of some communities that had nothing to do with the attack on 9-11, but yet we're seeing greater police surveillance in their communities. I think we're already seeing that now with the use of facial recognition tech. And I think privacy will become more of a luxury good if we do have it deployed in uh, public spaces like this, because who has the ability to sit at home and not go to a grocery store? That's going to be a more wealthy individual rather than a more uh, low-income individual. Got it. Got it. Um, well, you know, there's this sense that, you know, one of the things that allowed the internet to flourish so much was kind of a light touch regulation. And we had a whole hour long panel before this on section 230. Um, and sort of some of the, some of the factors that we're now grappling with because of that light touch regulation, right? I think there's a greater awareness that while it has given us some, you know, large and, and, and great companies like Google or Facebook or Amazon, there have been trade-offs to kind of that light touch regulation. As we look at something like AI or some of these emerging technologies, do you see Washington taking a different tack on those as we think about regulation? Ben, maybe let's start with you and work our way down the table. Could you just repeat the last part of the question again? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this idea of does Washington take a light touch regulation when it comes to AI or some of these emerging technologies, much like it did in the early days of the internet, or does it take a different approach now given some of the lessons learned? Uh, you know, I think that remains to be seen uh, to some degree. Uh, the, and there's another panel on this as well, but especially when we're talking about the rollout of 5G, and some of these other things that are going to be happening very soon. Um, we do see federal regulators like the FCC trying to um, push that forward. So they are, again, trying to take a light touch, more deregulatory, removing barriers, um, incentivizing investment in that infrastructure. Um, and we're talking about things like smart cities, smart infrastructure, um, you know, th so we can make real the ability to do like driverless vehicles and other things of, uh, of that nature. Um, so I, I think that for the time being seems to be the approach. Um, I don't know if there's anything quite akin to Section 230 on that front, like where we're trying, you know, where there's a debate about whether we should immunize certain platforms or anything like that. Um, but I do think it's something uh, that as of right now, there's still a recognition of the great benefits that are promised uh, as we experience new technologies going forward. Stephen, I'd predict that by 2030, our government will still be talking about regulating AI, but I don't think it's going to get in the way of the mechanical and incredibly unsexy part of AI that's called machine learning. This notion that if I expose a computer to zillions of images or pieces of data, that duh, the computer can identify patterns. Uh, Google Health did the uh, experiment with 76,000 patients, mammograms, and came up with uh, a simple machine learning discovery that was 8% better on false positives, not 8%, 7% better on false negatives than the doctors themselves had been. And that sort of innovation through machine learning is just letting machines do faster and broader what humans do when they try to identify and understand patterns. So I don't think we'll get in the way of that. But I do think that by 2030, we'll increase our enforcement of laws that prevent discrimination based on whether it was machine learning, AI or anything else, if there's discrimination in the granting of, of loans, mortgages, if there's discrimination in sentencing or granting a bail, I believe that the use of AI just, make it, just makes it even more important to enforce the laws we have against discrimination. But we can't stop the machines from learning if they're exposed to actual data. And that's going to happen between now and 2030 in, in even a greater degree. So uh, a lot of things on AI. <laughs> um, uh, my hope is that we ha will put ourselves in a position over the course of the next decade where AI is not going to be owned by the same four companies who are uh, running a lot of the internet today. Um, 
I hope that we will have future proof regulations that will uh, promote competition in AI. I hope that as we are working on the competition regulations today, um, that we are able to have technology neutral definitions. What we talk about is bottlenecks or gatekeepers. Um, and that if that kind of situation occurs again in AI, that the regulations are there so that we are prepared. Um, but there's so much more to AI than the concentration issues. Um, I think the discrimination issues that Steve mentioned are really important. It's really important that we have some accountability for these AI systems. And there is, I think, under current law, sometimes a difficulty for people to enforce their rights about AI because of this sort of black box. It's difficult to understand what is the AI really doing and how is it making it dis its decisions. And so we need some uh, system of accountability to be able to identify whether discrimination is actually happening in the AI or not. And that's something that I hope we can figure out before 10 years has passed. Yeah, and unsurprisingly, I agree a lot with Charlotte. Um, but I also hope that we'll have, by 2030, we won't be talking about AI as uh, inherently objective. And I hope that we'll move past that sort of stumbling block for ourselves. I also hope that we'll be talking about actual AI and not AI washing, which is just poor workers doing the work of a computer and then us calling it AI after the fact. And largely informing consumers only after a whistleblower has come forward that actually humans were listening to all your recordings, et cetera. Um, I also hope that we'll be putting greater emphasis on the civil rights departments and all of our federal agencies that work on non-discrimination laws so that they'll be able to handle the new tech that is coming in that is allowing some forms of discrimination to happen either unintentionally or without any uh, oversight. Got it. Well, I have a few more questions, and I will leave a couple minutes at the end if anyone in the audience has a question. I'm humble enough to share the moderator's microphone. Um, but I want to talk about, as we think about the future, you know, all the issues I've asked about, things like antitrust, privacy, AI, those are in our field of view right now, right? We know those are going to be issues that are going to play out over the next 10 years. What are some issues that, over the next 7 to 10 years, are going to be in the headlines that are going to emerge that maybe we're not talking about today? Well, at least when we haven't really talked about a lot here in this panel, um, issues of how to deal with uh, driver autonomous vehicles, um, including uh, drone technology, I think will become huge um, as the technology progresses on those fronts. I think that uh, something that's an opportunity, it's a very positive, this notion that uh, intellectual work that's done in the gig economy, not just uh, driving for Lyft or Uber or working at Thumbtack, but actually doing writing, programming, evaluation, analysis. That kind of work can occur in a very decentralized way in this country. And there are a lot of platforms that allow us to make our services available, to be rated by our peers reputationally, and to be able to measure the output of our work, an easy way to get paid for the amount of work. So there's a chance that over the next 10 years, we'll see an explosion of intellectual gig work through uh, what Sam Lesson calls the human cloud of people that we can tap into to get some help. Now, when you do that, though, we, we will have to watch for this notion of employer versus employee. And coming out of California, yet another brilliant idea from the Golden State is AB5. And uh, Stephen, in your profession in particular, journalists who submit more than 35 pieces to a single publication have to be classified as employees. So your profession has sued the state of California for this notion that everybody needs to become an employee instead of a contractor. And I do believe that that could be a barrier to the upside of the intellectual gig economy over the next 10 years. If we, uh, if we, if we believe that there's only an employee or you're a contractor, when in fact we should look at ways of providing benefits to people if they want to stay independent. So something we haven't talked about today that I think is really important is digital inclusion, making sure that people actually have access to all of these great benefits and sometimes difficult things about the internet. Um, that's an issue that's been really important for us at Public Knowledge as well. And I hope that over the next 10 years, you've got to imagine that by 2030, this is um, something that we've been able to do a better job of. I've been highlighting this earlier, but I do think that um, communal privacy is going to become more of an issue in 2030, especially with the deployment of AR, VR technologies. 
I know that we saw the boom and bust of Google Glass, but I do think that there's probably going to be some sort of uh, thing that we wear on our faces that lets us know that it's this temperature and this is the way I'm going on Google Maps because that's much better than looking down and looking up and possibly being hit by a car. So I think that that's going to be part of it, but I think within that discussion, we're going to have to have a greater understanding of what it means to be private in a public space. Um, we've talked for privacy for years as an individual's concern, which is helpful not only for pushing the uh, blame aside from companies who are splitting your privacy, but also putting the blame on you. I hope that we're going to have a more communal discussion in the future about what privacy means to us and how to make sure that we all have that privacy, no matter our socioeconomic status or access to tech. Well, now I want to ask the inverse of that question, which is, what are the what's an issue that we won't be talking about in seven to ten years? And maybe we're not talking about it because if we've come to realize it's overblown and not as big of a deal as perhaps it's being made out to be, or perhaps it's been settled. You know, we've reached some sort of regulatory decision or found some happy medium in the private sector um, that has re that has resulted in that issue being resolved. I, I hope and believe we won't be talking so much about content moderation on social media platforms in 10 years. I, I believe that humans are figuring this out. That was a discussion, Stephen, on the previous panel, and that the platforms themselves are happy to have us create smaller communities other than Facebook at large or go to a Facebook group. The CEO of Twitter announced an intention to allow technology so that people could do their own curation moderation of Twitter feeds so that you don't have to look at the giant Twitter sphere. You might look at something that's moderated and fed by somebody who you trust to have your interests at heart. So I don't think we'll be as concerned with these, this notion of forcing social media companies to somehow do what our Constitution prevents our government from doing and coming up with rules of censoring speech. I believe that we as citizens will do a better job in 10 years at self-selecting places where we find speech that uh, entertains, enriches, and, and maybe even educates us. I predict that one of the big four, or however many we decide there are now, tech companies will no longer be of significant public concern from an antitrust perspective in the next 10 years. Just like you know, cassettes were replaced by CDs and then iPods, and now we can stream music on any device, or Blockbuster and Hollywood Video weren't allowed to merge, but now we don't even, I don't even know if they exist because we have Netflix. Um, or Amazon, you know, kind of overtook the whole market from Borders and Barnes and Noble. I predict it, for at least one of them, if not Malta, of our big tech companies, we won't ever any longer be concerned about them because they'll be in the dustbin of history. Any guesses on which one? No. <laughs> I don't think I have a good answer to this question. I mean, this work is hard and it takes a long time. And I think even if we make great achievements, we will have to continue to defend them. Um, so my experience is that almost no issues go away. Um, I expect to still be explaining why the great regulations that I advocated for and, and are now happening um, should stay and not be undone 10 years from now. Um, I think I think we might still be talking about all these issues. Sorry. Yeah, I largely feel the same, but I do hope that uh, one of the areas that we kind of set a lot of conversations is around uh, autonomous vehicles or partially autonomous vehicles, because that's an area where we have the greatest chance to preserve human life while also making use of the technologies available to us. Um, and so I hope that that's one area where we can figure out how to balance privacy, security, safety, and autonomy all at once. And hopefully uh, we'll all have, I don't know, cars that can hover or something looking cool, but uh, that's, that's my hope. I had a debate with a colleague about whether or not flying cars would come up in a panel in the future of tech. <laughs> and so I think I just won that debate. Um, well, one more question for me, and then if there are audience questions, I mean, I can keep going, but I'd love to open the floor. And that's just, you know, I think sometimes to understand the future, it's helpful to look at the past, right? And I think you know, back to 10 years ago, you know, if you think about an industry that was constantly on the front page of newspapers and news sites that was being talked about as being regulated or regulation being imposed, you know, my mind immediately went to big banks and coming out of the recession, that was a big topic of conversation. Obviously, financial regulation is still an issue today, but it's not quite the same issue it was a decade ago. You know, I'm curious from, you know, as we're peering into this crystal ball, you know, are we still experiencing a a so-called tech lash 10 years from now? Is tech still in the hot seat the way it is today 10 years from now? Or have has attention in Washington moved on to some other industry that you know is now sort of in the crosshairs? Ben, what do you think? 
I, I think just to be consistent with some of my previous answers, yeah, it could be tech still, but I bet it won't be the same companies or the same issues. It'll be moved on to, you know, whether some company we don't even know exists yet is too big and powerful in whatever market it happens to be operating in. It'll be um, maybe a completely different type of technology altogether that we don't even have awareness of yet, and whether it's bad for our privacy concerns. Um, that's the dynamic nature of markets, and I predict, that's the one thing I will predict with confidence, is that we don't yet even know the challenges nor benefits that we're going to have from it. I think in the next 10 years, the focus will go away from tech and go to more towards, I think, three vectors of industry and, and progress that affect people more directly. And one would be fossil fuels fueled by our notion of climate change. And 10 years from today, the fossil fuel industry will be far more in the crosshairs than tech. Next to them in line would be food safety concerns. Might even have some relation to climate change, but food safety concerns will escalate. And then finally, pharmaceuticals and other sort of healthcare treatments where we have a great concern about uh, its effect on us and whether it's um, a product you can buy with integrity. So I believe they'll all be ahead of us in line in 2030 when we're having the same debate. So to respond to Ben's point, I do want to reiterate, I think if we don't act, we will be talking about these same companies in 10 years. Um, new technologies will come along, they may buy them, and there will not be new competitors. Um, so I'm, I'm really concerned, and I think we do need to act both with antitrust and with regulation. Um, the broader problem of uh, platform accountability, I think, could continue into new technologies. Um, this position of being a gatekeeper or a bottleneck, the general strategy of starting open and then um, you know, bringing a lot of users to your platform, and then once you become dominant, closing the platform and making it much more difficult for people, um, I think is a broadly applicable strategy that could be used by a lot of companies in other technologies in the future. So I think that's something that we will need to continue to be on the lookout for. I agree, of course, so we have to act now. I do think, though, that one thing that will be more important in five years or even 10 years is going to be e-waste and the right to repair ability of your products. Um, I think right now we already feel a little bit of like I don't know, resentment towards the planned obsolescence of all of our devices and the undisclosed support periods for those devices, but that's not really a huge issue right now. I think in a few years when you've been throwing away connected smart things for years that were once a toaster and now an oven that are not supported and now open to attacks, I think that it's going to make the right to repair discussion all the more salient, along with the coming uh, climate apocalypse is very much ahead of us. So I think that that's one thing that's going to have more discussions in the future, especially as people want to own or uh, change their tech more often than in the past. You see, the car was this wonderful human uh, consumer good that we could endlessly change uh, along with, you know, regulations around emissions. We could change to fit our own interests and uh, desires for creativity. I think our tech is going to continue to hopefully go in, that, uh, go in that direction and allow us to repair our tech and hold it on much longer than maybe some company would have planned for it to be in use. Any questions from the room? So um, that's not what I'm advocating for. Um, I am advocating for pro-competition regulations that will facilitate competition against uh, companies like Facebook. Um, 
I guess I, I, the political PowerPoint is maybe about lobbying and how many companies are able to have a lot of influence on how they are regulated. That's absolutely something that we want to be conscious of, um, both in t terms of trying to get new laws passed to set up a regulatory scheme, but also going forward. Um, my organization has a lot of experience advocating within regulatory proceedings at the FCC, um, so we know it can be uh, really difficult and influenced by those things. So that's something we want to be conscious of in setting up the systems that will be, hopefully, will be in place. Yeah, this notion that anytime something becomes really popular, that it needs to become a right and thereby you regulate it. I mean, the government is not the place to turn in terms of institution building, right? If it if it moves tax it, if it keeps moving, regulate it, and if it stops moving, subsidize it. That's what we end up with. We have hit our time wall, I'm so sorry. So hopefully panelists can stick around if they, if folks have a few questions for them, but the keynotes are next. So thank you all for joining us today and see you in 2030. <laughs>